um, is located in the northeast of Jakarta. As you may know, Jakarta is one of the great um, mega cities of Asia. A recent statistic showed that there are 26 million motorbikes in Jakarta, which must be uh, the largest number of motorbikes anywhere in the world. Um, welcome to our uh, seminar, Zuminar program. This is the beginning of the second semester. And um, the general uh, theme of the series of Zuminars is uh, language, society, and education. So far, we've tended to concentrate on language, but I hope that we can open it up to um, issues of society and education more broadly. Um, the scope is international, um, but there's also an Indonesian flavor uh, to the sessions, and um, we'll be talking about Indonesia in today's meeting. Um, before we begin, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Dedi Purwana, who is the director of the Graduate School, to um, say a few words to us. Uh, thank you, how well. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Subhan Zain. It's our pleasure uh, to have you here in uh, our routine program, uh, monthly international program. Uh, was uh, it is quite amazing when I read your academic uh, track records. Uh, you just received uh, as a top awarded Australia twenty twenty one top researcher in language and literature. I believe this is a good opportunity for us to have top researchers in uh, language and literature from Australia. And we are very pleased to have you and please sharing with our students and our participants. Uh, this uh, monthly international uh, Zuminar is part of our vision uh, being a reputable uh, postgraduate program in the uh, Asia region. So we try to develop uh, international activities. And this is the one uh, we routinely uh, conduct for our uh, lecturer and our student in postgraduate uh, at Universitas Negeri Jakarta. Thank you again, uh, Professor Subhan. Thanks also to Dr. Howell Coleman. Without him, this uh, occasion will not <laughs> happen. Thank you, Howell. And I hope in the near future, Howell and also Pa Faisal will uh, again and again to, to uh, run international initiative program to benefit for our institution. Thank you. And uh, this part, Professor Siono is uh, Vice Rector for Academic Affairs on behalf of Rector to open this uh, occasion officially. Thank you, Aurel. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, would you like to say something? Okay, yes, thank you, Prof. Uh, Aurel. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable, the Director of Postgraduate ONJ, Professor Didi Porwana. <clears throat> and the Honorable our Speaker for today's seminar, Subhan Zain PhD from Australian National University, Canberra. And also the moderator, Professor Hewell, and uh, distinguished guests and participants. Uh, on behalf of the Director of WNJ, I would like to welcome you to the monthly international program, Language, Society and Education. Firstly, I'd like to express my, my appreciation to the Postgraduate School, WNJ, for initiating this seminar. For WNJ, the collaboration seminar like this is uh, very important. It is one activity, I think, that support for realizing our university, university vision 
to become a reputable university in Asia. By collaborating with universities abroad, the quality of WNG will be improved and WNG will be internationally recognized. Of course, this seminar also very important for participants, especially for student and lecturers. Through this seminar, I'm sure that participant will get inspiration that are useful probably for solving the research problem or for inspiring the next research. I think the topic of this seminar is very interesting and very important for us and for our speakers who come in PhD. Thank you very much for being here with us, speaking about examining Indonesia's sociolinguistic linguistic situation from the Clusa to super Clusia. Uh, lastly, I, I hope all of you will have a wonderful seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Siono. Uh, so our speaker today, as you heard already, is uh, Dr. Supan Zain, who's teaching at the Australian National University in Canberra. Um, he moved there from Queensland. Um, he, Dr. Supan Zain is extremely... Thank you. Uh, Dr. Supan Zain is uh, extremely productive. He's published 32 articles and chapters and a number of books. And this is this is one of his books. I don't know, can you see it? Um, Language Policy in Super Diverse Indonesia and published okay. by Routledge. Um, and actually he comes from Chinere in Depok, which is where I am now. Um, Dr. Suban Zain was uh, spent his childhood here. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to hearing his talk. So, uh, uh, Suban, Lakanba. Okay. Um, thank you very oh, much. Um, sorry, can I just thank you. I, I, I will. Simply, Hello. Sorry, can I just asking, um, can I ask you to turn off your uh, microphones and um, videos um, because this will uh, make it easier and also if you have any comments or questions can you put them in the chat box please and then we'll discuss them at the end um, but Subhan can you adjust the, your screen slightly because we can't see your chin <laughs> we, oh you, you can't can. okay can you see it now yeah okay fine okay, okay thank you go ahead all right <laughs> okay um hello everyone um, good afternoon to um, so everyone in Jakarta. Um, it's evening for us in Australia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Problem based and case based. Uh, uh, hello. hello, can I continue? I think I, I still hear some background. Um, okay. Okay, yes, please, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, I've never been to um, Universitas Negeri Jakarta myself, but um, one of my cousins graduated from the university um, and so was one of my lecturers. So um, it's a reputable university and it's a pleasure for me to be able to um, share something to um, graduate students and lecturers um, of the university. So what I have here, is a topic on social linguistics, which I hope is of relevance to um, every one of you. Um, so can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay. I'm sorry, I still can hear um, some background noise. Um, is it possible to? Okay, great, thank you. All right, um, so the topic here is examining Indonesia's social linguistic situation from the glossia to superglossia. Um, the topic is drawn on a research that um, I have conducted and is outlined in my book, um, The Language Policy in Super Diverse Indonesia, which I 
um, wrote in 2020. Okay, so this is the overview of um, the presentation. Um, first, I'll show you, I will show you the abstract of the presentation, the map, elements of Indonesia's linguistic ecology, analysis of Indonesia's social linguistic situation. And then we go on to the fourth point, which is superglossia in super diverse Indonesia, and then the conclusion. So here's the abstract. Um, This presentation examines Indonesia's social linguistic situation. It discusses Indonesia's linguistic ecology using the super diversity perspective that is in ascendancy. It argues that previous conceptions such as diglossia, complex diglossia, and polyglossia fail to account for the complexity, dynamism, and polycentricity of the ecology. Many of you may be familiar with the concepts called diglossia and polyglossia, right? So now I would like to introduce you to a new concept called superglossia in order to cater for um, the complex um, linguistic ecology of Indonesia. So this concept is introduced to cater for Indonesia's super diversity, particularly in consideration of the importance of regional lingua francas, practices of language mixing, and the use of English as a lingua franca among others. Okay, so now well, let's move on to the map. Um, it is important to have an understanding, a comprehensive understanding of Indonesia's linguistic ecology. So far, we only know Indonesia's linguistic ecology as consisting broadly of Indonesian, indigenous languages and foreign languages. However, this understanding of Indonesia's linguistic ecology is just too um, shallow in many ways. And the reason being that there are many specific elements of these languages that, that can actually be further categorized. So for example, if we understand indigenous languages, what indigenous languages are we actually talking about? Is it big and dominant indigenous languages such as Javanese and Sundanese or small locally used indigenous languages such as Kalabit and um, Tawai? So that's just one part. The other part is the emergence of regional lingua francas or what I call RLFs. The regional lingua francas um, have not been taken into account in the conceptualization of ind indigenous of Indonesia's linguistic ecology in previous scholarship. And it is very important for us to understand what they are, their role and their function in society. The next one is heritage languages um, and then sign languages, foreign and additional languages, those languages that we know as Arabic, French, German, Japanese, Korean, and Mandarin, they can actually function as either foreign or additional languages, depending on circumstances, depending on the needs and situations. And then the next one, the next one is English as a lingua franca, not as a foreign language anymore. So let's move on to the first element. The first element is Indonesian, Bahasa Indonesia, as we know. So Indonesian is basically based on the Riau dialect of Malay, as you know. So it was chosen as the unifying language uh, more nearly two, uh, nearly 100 years ago in the Congress Sumpah Pemuda Kedua. And then um, it is stipulated in the national constitution as the national language as it reads in the article 36 of the 1945 national Constitu constitution. It says that Bahasa Nasional adalah Bahasa Indonesia. The national language is Indonesian. So for that reason, Indonesian is the official and national language. It is also the main medium of instruction in education from primary to tertiary levels of education. Um, well, in the, in the kindergarten too, except that kindergarten is not part of basic education. The language use of Indonesian is 
broad and multifaceted. It is very wide. Citizens of Indonesia aspire to be able to develop proficiency in Indonesian. And that's for many reasons. The main one is for prestige, right? Other motivations include the per pervasive notion that it is the vehicle for upward economic trajectory and social mobility. Well, of course, that is very important because in order to get a job that people will need to um, speak Indonesian and especially in settings, for formal settings such as in urban areas. So Indonesian is omnipresent, being used as the official language in the country in the domains of politics and the media. Now, when we talk about Indonesian, question usually arises when it comes to nativeness or, or literacy, because there have been many um, arguments circulating um, in, in the academia, and one of them is um, proposed by a scholar named Lauren Zent, um, and I'll get to um, one of her ideas. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, in the 1980s, uh, research by um, Nababan in 1980, Five, then says that the number of native speakers of Indonesia at that time, right, ranged between seven, uh, was around 17 million, right? That was in 1980s. And then it went up to 35 million in the 1990s. And that's based on research by uh, Professor Anton Mulyono and Charles Grimes in 1995. Um, because of this reason, uh, many scholars, especially Western scholars, have developed some skepticism as to whether Indonesians actually speak Indonesian, right? Um, they think that many Indonesians do not actually speak Indonesian. So um, one of the argument put forward by Zen is the idea that uh, Indonesian, um, people in Indonesia have very low literacy rate in the language. However, this idea um, I have debunked this idea because the literacy level of Indonesia based on the 2010 census was actually 92.8%. Um, and then in the recent, the most recent census in 2020, that was more than 99%, which means that nearly all Indonesian people could read and write in Indonesian. However, that does not necessarily mean that they could speak standard Indonesian. So there's a big confusion in here because Indonesian as a language is very broad where the idea of Indonesian as a language um, could actually include derivatives of Malay, right? So for example, when somebody actually speaks, um, when somebody actually speaks real Malay, they would think that they speak, they're speaking Indonesian when actually they're not. So there's, so that is the big problem in terms of data sophistication. And also another problem is language shift because now, because nowadays many um, speakers of indigenous languages have turned towards um, speaking Indonesian. So many of them are now um, developing proficiency in Indonesian and leaving behind the languages of their ancestors. And then the next one is that literacy in Indonesian does not necessarily mean mastery. So in many cases, many people um, think that they speak Indonesian, uh, but they don't actually master the language so that when they do UKBI, which is Uji Kompetensi Bahasa Indonesia, they don't actually get a good score, right? They don't really actually uh, obtain a good score, which is questionable. And that happened um, in a research um, involving some high school teachers of Indonesian language in Jakarta. So now we move on to the next element of um, Indonesia's um, linguistic ecology, and that is indigenous languages. There are many terms that have been used by scholars. One of them is vernacular. Regional language or bahasa daerah is the most common one. Local language, bahasa local, has also been used, and that was used by one of them by um, Sultan Takdir Ali Shabana. And then heritage language was also used in a research by um, Bambang Suwarno. However, it is more appropriate to refer to, to the languages spoken by the local people as indigenous language, right? So when it's plural, then indigenous languages. So we have an equivalent in Indonesian, and that would be Bahasa 
pribumi. So saying bahasa pribumi would be more appropriate than saying bahasa daerah or bahasa lokal. Of the living languages in Indonesia, um, estimates show that at least there are six, 652 of them are indigenous languages, right? So that's based on a research by Badan Bahasa. So Badan Bahasa um, conducted research in 2017 and they estimate that 652 are indigenous languages. However, data from Ethnologue suggests that 701 indigenous languages, there are 701 indigenous languages and six non-indigenous languages. And these six non-indigenous languages are those that are called heritage languages. So in terms of linguistics, scholars um, in Ethnologue themselves have actually classified, have actually classified languages in Indonesia in terms of whether they are indigenous or heritage. As I said, that we need to use the term indigenous languages rather than regional languages, so that we could make a distinction between indigenous languages and heritage languages. Now, if we would like to see the distribution of languages and in, in Indonesia, then it looks like this. So we have major islands and regions in Indonesia from Sumatra, Jawa, right, and Bali, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, West Nusa Tenggara, East Nusa Tenggara, Maluku, and Papua, right? Uh, Ma Papua as an island on its own has got 384 languages. So that's more than half. So more than half, well, yeah, more than half of the total number of languages in Indonesia um, are in Papua, 384. Most of these languages are small and locally used languages. Um, languages in Sumatra, there are 26 of them, 10 of them in Java and Bali, 57 in Kalimantan. So you've got Dayak languages and they are all branching out into many different um, tribal, tribal languages, um, small tribal languages spoken around um, the island, um, spoken throughout the island of Kalimantan, as well as regional um, lingua franca, such as Banjar. And then in Sulawesi, we have roughly similar number of languages. We have 58 languages spoken in Sulawesi, 11 in West Nusa Tenggara, 68 in East Nusa Tenggara, and then 66 in Maluku. So as you can see here, the distribution of these languages is uneven, right? We have less languages in the Western part of Indonesia, which is Sumatra and Java. And then we have more languages in the central part of Jakarta, which is Kalimantan and Sulawesi. And then we have a lot more of languages in West Nusa Tenggara, in the Eastern part of Indonesia, consisting of West Nusa Tenggara, East Nusa Tenggara, Maluku and Papua. Now, um, if, we, if we are looking at numbers, then this is what we have. We have Indonesia's 13 largest languages. What are they? The first one is Javanese. Second one is Sundanese, Malay, Maduris, Minangkabau, Banjar, Bugis, Balinese, Batak, Cirebon, Sasak, Achenese, and Betawi, right? So these are the biggest languages in Indonesia. Most of them, right? Um, most of them um, have got more than 1%. Well, um, the lowest one is Betawi has got, um, Betawi has got 1.05%. Right? However, even though these are the biggest languages in Indonesia, um, their status is actually quite um, worrying, right? Especially for Achenese and Betawi, because for these last two languages, their um, EGIDS, which is um, scale level for um, the um, level of um, vibrancy of the use of languages in society, um, that's EGIDS, um, shows that these two languages are at the six level, which means that they are threatened, right? So Achenese and Betawi are threatened, whereas languages such as Javanese and Sundanese, they are okay because they are used in the educational domain, and then Sundanese is developing, Malay is vigorous, other languages are also developing. However, it is quite worrying for big languages such as Achenese and, and Betawi because they are already threatened. 
which leads us to the question of language endangerment. So small locally used indigenous languages in particular, in particular, they are threatened with endangerment, right? So um, small locally used indigenous languages are usually used within tribes. So there is an example here that we have. Kalabit is a language spoken in Kalimantan. It's spoken by 640 speakers. There is also a language called Waru spoken by 350 speakers. Other languages are even spoken by less than 100 speakers. For example, Tawai in um, Papua and then Yetfa um, also in Papua. They're spoken by less than 50 people. So many of these languages in Indonesia are, are now dying, right? It's very worrying because if we're looking at this graph, then we can see that there's a trend, right? There's a trend of dying or dead languages in Indonesia. And the trend is increasing. It, based on the research in 1994, there were less than 50, right? There were less than 50 languages dying at that time. Probably the number stood at 25, right? Let's say 25. However, in 2013, 2013, which is around nine years ago, we had more than 150 languages dying. So let's say the number was 170. So around 170 languages, right? Around 170 languages were already, were already dying in 2013. So if we're looking at this trend and this trend can, continues, then what's going to happen in the future? So Carl Ardenberg, wrote a paper in 2015 predicting that within a decade, we'd be losing right half of our languages because the numbers would lead to more than 300 languages dying in 2032, which is about 10 years from now. I'm sorry to say, but that's based on um, scientific evidence. And I think we really need to do something about it. Um, as part of our discussion. Now, um, let's move on to the next element of regional lingua francas, um, of linguistic ecology in Indonesia, and that is regional lingua francas. What is regional lingua francas? Regional lingua francas are basically languages that connect people at regional, lang at regional level. So there are many languages, for example, Ambon Malay, Bakumpai, Musi, Ngaju, and Onin, right? Scholarship has traditionally defined them as local or regional languages. However, this designation is not entirely accurate. It's not actually correct because they also serve as languages of wider communication, right? So according to research by Nahir, they ensure mute, these languages ensure mutual intelligibility within a group of cognate languages in a given region. So these languages connect people at the regional level between villages, communities, regencies, provinces, okay? So I call, following Nahir, I, I call this group of languages as regional lingua francas. So in Indonesia, there are at least 43 of them. 14 of them are Malayic and 29 of them are non-Malayic. What is Malayic RLF? So we have a group of languages called Malayic RLFs. These are indigenized varieties of Indonesian or Malay. So these languages are associated with Malay. They are associated with Indonesian. So for example, Alor Malay, Ambon Malay, Bachan Malay, Banjar Malay, Kupang Malay, Kutai Malay, Tenggarong variant. So Kutai Malay, Malay has got a few dialects and the one that we are including here is the Tenggarong variant. Makassar Malay, Manado Malay, North Maluku Malay, Papuan Colloquial Indonesian, which is different from Papuan Malay, Pontianak Malay, Rio Indonesian, and Sekado Malay. So that's uh, Malayic RLFs. The non-Malayic RLFs, these are languages that are not indigenized, varieties of Malay or Indonesian. In other words, they are not linguistically associated with Malay or Indonesian. There are 29 of them. What are they? Bakumpai, Bia, Bugis, Damal, Ekari, Fayu, Geser, Iban, Iha, Isirawa, Kaililedo, and Kandaya, right? 
There are also other languages called Koiwai, Lamaholot, Mandarin, Manggarai, Moi, Mamuna, Musi, Ngaju, Onin, Polis, Dani, the Fehan da dialect of Tetun, Tukang Besi, Ternate, Wandamen, Wano, Wolio, and Yetfa. So as I said earlier, Yetfa, um, as a small um, indigenous language, is also a non-Malayic regional lingua franca. So a language can be a small locally used indigenous language, but it can also serve as non-Malayic regional lingua franca, such as Yetfa. It's one of the examples. And then there's also one interesting example of Mandarin, as you can see here. Mandarin here it can serve the function as a regional lingua franca, and it is also a heritage language. So depending on how you see it, right? Depending on how you see it, when people live in different areas in Kalimantan, they are usually, these people are usually the descendants, um, the Chinese descendants. They can't, they can't use Hakka languages. Uh, sorry, they cannot use Hakka or Hokkien languages. They use Mandarin instead as a heritage language. So, sorry, as a um, regional lingua franca. So there are many, Chinese descendants in Indonesia, and they speak different varieties of Chinese, Hakka, Hokkien, um, Teochew, and they all um, don't understand each other. They need a uh, regional lingua franca, and for that reason, then they use Mandarin. The same with people living in Sulawesi, right? Um, they have different um, indigenous languages used at the local level. Then for that reason, they would need a uh, non-Malayic regional lingua franca, and for their for their region, they would speak Bugis, for example. And then the next one is heritage languages. Heritage languages are not mentioned in previous literature, right? So if you're looking at literature from the time of uh, Professor um, Nababan and then Professor um, Sunyono Darjobijoyo, then you can see that none of them spoke about heritage languages. However, the idea of heritage languages itself is also conflated with indigenous languages, for example, in a research by Suwarno. This term specifically will need to be used, especially when we would like to understand the kind of language that is spoken at home, right? Or otherwise readily available to young children. And crucially, this language is not a dominant language of the larger society. So for example, young children speaking Javanese, we cannot consider Javanese as a heritage language because Javanese is a dominant language. However, if, we're talk if we are talking about um, Hakka, then there are many Chinese children who speak Hakka, then Hakka is considered as a heritage language. In Indonesia, um, heritage language speakers include descendants of the Arabs, Indians, Japanese, Eurasians, Mardikers, and Chinese, right? We call them Keturuna, right? So all descendants. So that's why we have Keturunan Jepang, Keturunan Arab, and Keturunan China. Sign languages. Ah, interestingly, many scholars also um, did not consider sign languages as part of Indonesia's linguistic ecology, which in this case, they should be included, right? But we need to have um, understanding of sign languages in Indonesia because it is uh, they are part of um, Indonesia's linguistic ecology. So sign languages of, for the deaf community of Indonesia, there are many of them, right? Because there are at least 2.5 million of Indonesians um, are actually users of sign languages. However, interestingly, um, the latest data that I've got here from the BPS, um, Badan Pusat Statistik, only points to the existence of around 40,000 sign language users. I haven't got data from the 2020 census. So probably the number, probably the number um, is a bit bigger than that. So there, as I said earlier, there are many sign languages used in Indonesia. However, there are two most common ones, and these are System Isyarat Bahasa Indonesia, right? Our Indonesian sign system, we call that CB. And the other one is Bahasa Isyarat Indonesia, Indonesia or Indonesian Sign Language, or called Bisindo. Foreign and additional languages. Foreign and additional languages are two distinctive categories, right? We cannot just um, categorize languages and generalize them. We need to be able to specifically distinguish them. So languages such as Arabic, English, 
French, German, Japanese, Korean, and Mandarin, these are usually considered as foreign languages, okay? As we know already, and these languages are also taught in schools, right? So Arabic, there is tuition on Arabic in school, on English, French, and so on. However, if we're looking at social linguistics, then a proper examination of this, the use of these languages in society, then we can no longer consider them as foreign languages. There are at least three reasons for that. One is that determining input solely through school hours does not reflect the present social linguistic reality. So if we're talking about Japanese and Korean, right, being a foreign language because there are only two hours of these languages in schools, okay, well, that's not really true because in fact, there are many um, high school students um, learning Japanese and Korean outside school, right? Um, they learn, um, in fact, they could learn um, Japanese and Korean more than they do learn Indonesian or more than they do learn um, English, right? How do they do that? Because they attend courses in private courses in Japanese. They attend private courses in Korean. Many of them also read Japanese manga, right? They also read comic Com comic books in, in Japanese. Many of them watch Korean TV drama. So, uh, these so are, then, that's, yes? uh, about five minutes. Five oh, minutes five left. minutes okay. left. Okay. <laughs> I haven't got anywhere. <laughs> okay. Next one is learning is not necessarily a matter of educational requirement. There are also other uh, motivations, instrumental motivation, aesthetic and cultural motivation, and personal agency. Okay. English now is moving to um, from the position of English as a foreign language to English as a lingua franca. Um, the mainstream scholarship says that it is a foreign language. However, now scholars, many scholars have argued against the use of English as a foreign language because now English is transitioning into a lingua franca. The reasons are there. One of them is the use of English in society and greater um, is actually English is actually playing a much greater role in society and that there is greater exposure to English outside school hours. And there are also other reasons in here, right? Like transitioning to polycentric perspectives of English and then the use of English um, in the realm of English education, English language education and the domain of teacher education. And then there is also a question about the use of English as a lingua franca and language policy. What is acceptable English? That's a big question. And then the appropriacy of use English as a lingua franca and character building. Right. Now, after knowing all of the linguistic elements, so linguistic ecology, the elements of linguistic ecology, then we analyze it. There is a concept called the glossia, and I don't think I need to introduce this to everybody. It's basically the idea that, that there is a stable language situation where you have the high variety and the low variety, right? And then for some scholars such as Snedden, then Indonesia has got this deglossic feature, okay? Um, however, um, if you use the glossia, then we actually cannot capture the complexity of Indonesia's linguistic ecology. So that's why many scholars, such as Lo Bianco, Anton Mugliono, and Grimes, they said that actually we have the glossia in multilingualism, or we have complex multilingual diglossia, or we have polyglossia, or we have complex polyglossia, right? So many other terms have been offered. However, um, still, we this concept cannot cater for the complexity of Indonesia's social linguistic situation because those concepts do not take into account the Malayic and the non-Malayic regional lingua francas. They do not take into account heritage languages, the use of language in the religious domain, and many other factors. So we need a new concept here, and that concept is superglossia. It is drawn from the idea of super diverse environments, which are polycentric, where actually we could have more than one H. We could have more than one high variety. It is not only Indonesian, but it, it, it may also be other languages functioning as high variety in society. So when we have the idea of polycentricity, right, uh, the idea of other elements of linguistic ecology that could become centers of normativity, that could become the centers of norm normativity, then 
Uh, it defines the policy that imposes Indonesian as the only H because we can actually have many H. So for example, we have uh, Malayic RLFs, we have non-Malayic RLFs, and these Malayic and non-Malayic RLFs, they are competing against one another. They are also competing against Indonesian. So in society, it is very rare that people would use standard Indonesian when a non-Malayic RLF is spoken in society. And the same with um, Malayic RLF, right? And then when we're looking at the interglossic relationships among the regional lingua francas themselves, then we can see that they're actually hierarchy. So for example, if we have two regional lingua francas, they're also competing with one another. Papuan Malay against Wandamin, Wandamin, Onin against Iha, Bugis against Makassar Malay. And then um, they also compete against major indigenous languages. So regional lingua francas against Javanese, regional lingua francas against, Jav against Sundanese. And then we also have um, intensive and dynamic language contact between speakers of different languages and dialects, right? So because of that reason, then we have diversification of language practices. When we have this, then um, we, it gives rise to new languages. So these new languages branch out from an indigenous language. So for example, this is the case of Osing in Banyuwangi, branching out from Javanese spoken, the Javanese dialect spoken in East Java. And then some indigenous languages could have um, could be accorded a similar status with the official H, right? So for example, we have Javanese and Sundanese. They actually um, have high status in um, Central Java and also um, West Java, and then Papua and Malay also in Papua. And then some languages used in the religious domain cannot be discounted. Um, and that's because um, they are used in religious worship. We cannot, as, a Muslim, as Muslims, for example, we cannot use Indonesian to pray, right? The same with the Balinese Hindus. They cannot use Indonesian to pray. They have to use Sanskrit, especially when it comes to perform um, rituals in the Balinese Hindu um, religion. And then intralinguistic hierarchy, for example, when we have registers ranging from low to medium to high, so we have this in languages such as Javanese and Sundanese that have um, high, medium, and low registers. And then languages that um, have come to um, the educational domain, such as Arabic, English, and so on, they also need to be considered. And then in the previous scholarship, they are basically generalized into one category as foreign languages, when in fact they're not. And then also we have heritage languages and sign languages. We cannot just forget them, we cannot just neglect them. They also need to be taken into account. And then the next one is that practices of language mixing. As you know, Bahasa Campur Campur is just everywhere. Most Indonesians speak Bahasa Campur Campur. So that needs to be taken into account as well. So superglossia is a concept that I have introduced here in order to cater for the um, dynamism and polycentricity in the Indonesia's linguistic ecology. It's a polycentric, so that it is a polycentric sociolinguistic situation in which linguistic varieties and practices of language mixing interact and perform relationships that are complex and dynamic, often interglossic and sometimes intraglossic, reflecting their varying degrees of status, influence, and order of importance. So in a typical situation, we have a H variety and then use as a national language, sometimes use in education and also the mass media. There are also other elements such as regional lingua francas, major indigenous languages, locally used indigenous languages, heritage languages, sign languages, languages used in a particularly domain, dominant domain such as religion, imported languages and practices of language mixing and new linguistic varieties. This concept is not empirically proven yet, so there has not been um, specific research into that. However, it has been conceptually validated in a review by Dr. Howard Manns, a senior um, linguist at Monash University. Um, I understand if scholars might bristle right, at the term superglossia because we've already got other terms, okay? But for him, it is convincing. 
um, because it reflects the complex series of hubs and peripheries um, that make up the Indonesian linguistic context. So that's pretty much um, the idea of superglossia, and this is the conclusion. Now we know that Indonesia is not static. Indonesia is always complex and dynamic. It is a polycentric, super diverse context. Um, we have previous concepts that have been used to in understand Indonesia's linguistic ecology, but they do not account for the true complexity, dynamism, and polycentricity of Indonesia's linguistic ecology. So for that reason, we need a new concept, um, and I'm introducing superglossia that accounts for all factors in Indonesia's complex, dynamic, and polycentric linguistic ecology. However, um, as many theories, um, superglossia will need empirical studies. We need research that can either prove this or disprove it. So that's the end of my presentation. If you are interested in examining further, then this is the list of references. And I'd be happy to um, contribute more in the question and answer session. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Professor Ben. Very interesting, pr provocative uh, presentation, full of ideas and facts. Um, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. I have I have some <laughs> some questions myself, but I'll, I'll let other people ask questions first. I can't see any questions in the chat box. Um, who would like to begin? Comments or questions? Just go ahead directly. Can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Yeah, it's Musna from Mauritius. Thank you very much, Professor Zain. I really in, it was really interesting presentation. Um, because my research focuses on religious and sacred languages and literacies, I was um, maybe surprised not to see in your categorization sacred languages and literacies as one uh, major significant category when you were categorizing the languages. So that was my first question <coughs> slash comment. Um, the second question is with respect to the definition of literate in the census questionnaire in Indonesia. Could you just tell me how literate is defined? Thank okay, you very thank much, you. Professor. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for, for the two interesting questions. With the first one, um, I did not use the term sacred language um, in there. I use language, um, the term language in the religious domain. All right, and this term is an acceptable term in the field of language policy. Um, you know, um, a senior scholar in the field, um, his name is Professor Bernard Spolsky from uh, Bar Ilan University in Israel, right? He's one of the people who introduced the concept of language in the religious domain. So in language policy, we've got different domains such as family, school, and then religion, right? And then military, business, place, and so on, right? So these are domains which make up um, the environment, okay, the environments in which languages are used, right? <laughs> so when I say uh, languages in the religious domain, um, that does not um, mean that, that does not necessarily mean that um, the languages are not sacred, right? When in fact they are sacred. That's why they are used for rituals. That's, that's why they are used for um, religious purposes, for worship and so on. So I hope that answers your question. And then the second one, that's a very intriguing question in as with regard to literacy, because that's exactly the question that uh, Professor Zent from University of Houston was also asking, you know, what does it actually mean by <laughs> literate in Indonesia, right? So if you look at the census question, okay, Bapak dan Ibu, kalau Anda perhatikan pertanyaan census, Anda akan lihat, apakah Anda bisa berbicara bahasa Indonesia? Apakah Anda bisa menggunakan bahasa Indonesia. So the question is, can you use Indonesia, right? And the, the word use here, okay? The word use here could be anything, right? It could be listen to it. It could be um, write, um, write. It could be um, read, okay? Read in the language or speak the language, but to what extent, okay? So um, the statistics that I was showing you, right? They are based on this very vague question. Okay, which for some group of people, it is interpre interpreted this way. For other group of people, right? For other groups of people, it is interpreted in different ways. 
So it's really confusing. That's why I pointed out the idea of data sophistication. When I was talking about this issue with uh, members of the Badan Bahasa, so there were three um, authorities from the Badan Bahasa that whom I was interviewing for the purpose of this book. Um, they said that, that, well, we were actually trying to specify for the census. Um, there is a bureaucracy, you know, um, preventing us from making the question more um, specific. They couldn't make it more specific they had to do it and then at the same time they said something like in order to add one question then you will have to pay dua million two billion rupees right which is around 200,000 Australian dollars and I don't understand why would you have you know pay 200,000 um, Australian dollars just to put one question about literacy or one sub question about literacy in the census and they said that you know, it's it's how the ministry works. You know, between Ministry of um, Foreign, uh, the domestic domestic affairs, who's organizing the census, and the Ministry of Education. So I guess that's the elite level level. You know, the, the elite level. I don't know how how they work, but in the end, the proposal of specific questions literacy just didn't come through. So that's why. Yeah. So okay. then the bar. Uh, um, can we move on to another yeah. question from Ibu Lina? Can you hear me? Ibu Lina Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Ibu, okay. Ibu Lina. Irina, sorry. Ibu Lina Husnaini Febianti. You have a question. I'll read the question for you. Dear Dr. Zain, would you mind sharing with us? How you conducted your spectacular research? How did you plan the research methodology? Um, huh. um, I don't think I don't think you can say that it is spectacular if you haven't read it. <laughs> I need I think you need to read it first, then you can have that comment. But anyway, um, I think that's an exaggeration. The idea is that I was using different methods. Uh, basically, this was an <clears throat> eclectic um, kind of research. Basic, um, mostly it was mo mostly it was this uh, based research, um, so secondary research. However, I also conducted um, some interviews with people from different um, areas. So there were um, teachers, there were teacher educators, um, authorities working in the Baden Bahasa. So in other words, they were policymakers. I also um, conducted follow-up discussions um, with a few of them, okay? So the idea with this is that um, what is really missing is um, the, a comprehensive understanding of Indonesia's linguistic ecology because we only understand um, some elements of the ecology. We do not have the big picture, right? We do not have the big picture. We do not have the map. Okay, so if you read chapter two of my book, Language Policy in Super Diverse Indonesia, then you will read the map. Okay, you will see the big picture, right? Whether or not you agree with that, then it's up to you, right? You will have to um, do something about it, whether you conduct more research to challenge the idea that I'm proposing there or to validate my research. Okay, so it has to come from the big picture first, okay? And then all the other um, research comes after that, right? Okay, is there another, another question? Is there another question? Yeah, from Ibu Tasha Amalia. Okay. Um, from your teaching experience in Australia, what do you think is the one crucial linguistic problem we encounter in Indonesia, which is rarely identified and often neglected by the local people? And then a separate question, is there any specific course that graduate linguistic students in Indonesia should be exposed to? So there are two questions there. Okay, I'm I'm still trying to understand the first question. One crucial linguistic problem we encounter. Maybe Tasia, Tasia can give a more detailed explanation. Tasia Amalia, would you please give more detail about your questions? 
Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I was uh, wondering the uh, since I think the linguistic field uh, is not very much um, understood by uh, many uh, Indonesian people, and, and they still ask, "What is linguistic uh, in the um, language um, perspective?" And I think uh, I would like to ask, "What do you think uh, is the one?" linguistic problem that is rarely identified and um, often not uh, realized by many people that is happening in Indonesia. Okay, right. Um, one linguistic problem. I think it's not, a, I'm not, I'm not really um, into identifying problems, um, really. I'm into building awareness, right? So, um, the problems are there, right? And the pro the problem, many problems, and the biggest problem here is lack of awareness. Um, for example, us as linguistic scholars, um, we rarely identify lots of different things occurring in society, right? Uh, lots of different things occurring in society that can actually be um, research, you know, that can actually be examined, that can actually be investigated. Um, and we just let them pass, you know? We just let them pass. We don't really think deeply about the use of language of society. So one example would be the use of language by celebrities, okay? The use of language of celebrities is very rich and they are very innovative and they are very, creative okay one celebrity for example um i don't follow indonesian <laughs> celebrity or shows but i <clears throat> read you know how people use different words and invent new terms and so on and many of them are introduced by celebrities right so for example a few years ago there was a term called sesuatu right sesuatu banget yeah? and there was a celebrity introducing that and then everybody in Indonesia, most people in Indonesia were familiar with it, you know, and they used it on a regular basis. Sesuatu, sesuatu, sesuatu. And then now there's another term called Sultan, right? Sultan, Sultan, Sultan. So when someone is very rich, we call him Sultan. When someone is powerful, we call him Sultan. It comes from a celebrity. It is accepted by many people and then now it is regularly used so the use of language by celebrity is just one example and this has not been researched right indonesian people many indonesian people are very much entertainment centered okay however this area has been far too far neglected by linguistic scholars so it is encountered on a daily basis but neglected so um Batasha, i hope that answers your question yeah Right, so is that right? Yes, thank you okay. very much. Right, the, the use of language in oh, by celebrity. Right? Okay. And then the next one is, is there any specific course that graduate linguistic students in Indonesia should be exposed to? Well, <laughs> um, that would be like making recommendations to curriculum design and development, right? <laughs> I, I haven't seen... Um, I haven't seen courses um, in Universitas Negeri Jakarta. I haven't seen the, the curriculum, but um, I think um, when it comes to curriculum in a slightly, it needs to be um, revised in many ways. There are many new terms. There are many developments in the field that have not been updated, right? So for example, the, con the concept of <laughs> post methods pedagogy in language teaching, Right. Um, this is a new concept for many language teachers, for many teacher educators in Indonesia, when in fact, this is a concept introduced around 20 years ago by Professor Kumara Vadivelu. So a concept that was introduced 20 years ago, right, now is gaining trend in Indonesia, right? But at the same time, there are many trends such as translanguaging, plurilingualism, super diversity, right, and other, and other terms that people are, um, are not familiar with, that linguistic scholars are not familiar with. So I think we need new um, conceptions of applied linguistics in Indonesia, whatever the courses are, right? Whatever the courses are. Okay, so I hope that answers um, the second question. 
Okay, there's time for one last question, I think, from Bapak Fuad Arif Budiartanto. Uh, dear Mas Subhan, super glossier to me sounds as though it's expressing power relations, where one language is superordinate compared to others, as opposed to the term complex diglossia that you mentioned previously. What's your comment? Thank you, Mas Fuad. My, um answer would be very simple. I look forward to reading your article challenging <laughs> my point. <laughs> no, well, yeah, well, I'd be very interested if people are looking at it um, that way, right? Yes, indeed, super denotes the idea of power relations. And in fact, it does, right? When we consider Indonesian as a, as a age, um, as a official H, then Indonesian is at the top, right? However, when we go to Wandaman, then in the to the to an area called Wandama Bay, there's a language called Wandaman, and there's Wandaman is fighting against Papuan Malay, and Wandaman is also fighting against Indonesian, right? Who's winning in there? In some contexts, Indonesian is winning, in other contexts, Wandaman is winning. So there you go. There is power relations. There is a power struggle between those languages. Okay. I mean, we cannot um, ignore the fact that languages are competing for space, that languages are competing for influence. Even when you have the, the terms like just complex, complex diglossia, um, that, that does not deny the fact that those languages are still competing. So, Masfuat? Hello, okay. Masfuad. Masfuad is my senior. Thank you. We used to take a course together. <laughs> I hope I can see your face, Masfuad. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Hello, Mas. <laughs> Salam alaikum. <laughs> Congratulations, Masfuad. Yeah. Okay, can we okay. move on? I hope that answers your question, Masfuad. Yeah? Yes, thank you. Yes. Can we move okay, on? Next the question, question from uh, Harbi Putra, who's one of our PhD students at uh, Universitas Negeri Jakarta. Dear uh, Subhan, what do you think about the new language, Bahasa Campur Campur, on the middle of young teenagers uh, communicating on their community, such as the word judurli, meaning honestly? Yeah. I think you mentioned this. Yeah, well, that's, as I said, the use of language in socia social media is very vibrant, right? Mm -hmm. uh, many of the uh, people are influenced by celebrities um, in Indonesia. Um, and the terms such as jujurli um, and also the, what is it, the excessive use of, of, of E, right? Pigiminisi, uh, for example, for bagaimanasi, right? They change it into bigiminisi. That's very common among young people. And young people in Indonesia are actually very creative, okay? It is up to us, right, as linguistic scholars <laughs> to take out this opportunity to investigate the use of languages. So um, the use of Bahasa Campur Campur only reflects, right, the diversity of um, Indonesian people. And it also reflects the creativity of the people. It is not be um, scorned, you know, it's not something to be ridiculed, right? It is something to be investigated. Our attitude, our attitude towards Basa Champur Champur has changed considerably from the time <laughs> of the order, right? the time of the past, when the use of Basa Champur Champur was shunned. It was also ridiculed by authority. Many people were um embarrassed to use bahasa campur campur because everybody was required to use indonesian nowadays it doesn't work like that people are more versatile people are more dynamic and they are free to express um, their ideas they're ex they're free to express the way they communicate with each other and social media gives them the platform so that's why we can see this jujurli that's why we can see this sultan or bigimini you know as a <laughs> as a form of freedom of expression linguistically. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Before we close, I'd like to make it, actually I have lots of comments and questions, um, but I'd just like to raise one point about the issue of literacy. 
Yes. Um, which uh, somebody asked about earlier. Um, I noticed that you talked about, um, you said at one point, the claim of low literacy has been debunked. Yes. Um, and I think we agree that that one question in the census about um, knowing Bahasa Indonesia is not, is not useful. But another source of information about literacy is the results of the PISA test, which takes place yes. every three years um, in Indonesia and many other countries as well, looking at the uh, competency in the national language, the reading competency in the national language of 15 year old students. Uh, and the most recent um, test in 2018 um, showed that 70% uh, of 15 year olds in Indonesia did not reach the basic level of uh, literacy in, in reading, the level which uh, is considered to be essential for functioning in society. And this is, this is very serious and it's been recognized by the government. Um, so this is uh, something yes. that's um, widely understood. For example, two days ago in Compass, Papa Anidito Aditomo um, wrote something about this. He's the head of the um, curriculum, uh, educational standards and educational assessment body in the Ministry of Education. And he said, Hanya sekitar 30% murid kelas Indonesia memiliki kecakapan minimum dalam hal memahami bacaan dan bernalar secara matematika. Only 30% of uh, children at the level of uh, classes 9 and 10 uh, are uh, li literate and um, have nu and numerate. So, any, any reactions to that? Yes. Well, um, it's saddening, to be honest. And yeah, this really. just gives more and more, um, you know, it gives us a um, stronger impression um, as to why our educational interventions have not been very successful, right, over the years. Um, yeah. I remember reading an, a research by um, somebody from Pusat Bahasa um, who conducted research among um, high school teachers um, in Indonesia. I think I mentioned that um, earlier in my presentation. She conducted research um, with high school teachers in Indonesia who taught Indonesian. And then about half of them could not reach uh, advanced level in Bahasa Indonesia. Jadi yeah. dalam Bahasa Indonesia mm -hmm. saja mereka tidak sampai 50%. So the sample, well, of course, the sample was quite limited because it only uh, it was only less than 3,000 teachers and they were all living in Jakarta. But if we could have this national, national um, broad survey, you know, involving teachers from every province in Indonesia, then we would have more comprehensive understanding of how good we are in Indonesia. However, the problem is so far we haven't got that data. We haven't got that yeah. research. And I think <clears throat> it is very necessary that we do that. And so that's my first comment. My second comment is that um, one of the limitations of my book is that I did not include data, literacy, um, data on literacy from PISA. I only included data from um, Biden Pusat statistics, right? So Biden Pusat statistics and also some um, research uh, published by um, local journals in Indonesia, such as Makara and also um, Linguistic <coughs> Indonesia. So, um, in these journals, um, they did not mention anything about, about PISA, but thank you for bringing that um, to my attention. I think it's really important. Um, and I think um, a research that takes into account um, the use of language in society, right? On the one hand, the use of language by teachers, on the other hand, as well as the use of language by students, right? So these three components will need to be investigated. If we could cover these three areas, the use of language in society, the use of language by teachers, and the use of language by students, then I think we would have, you know, much stronger understanding of um, the sociolinguistic situation in the country. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So a challenging research agenda there, which will... <laughs> yes, <laughs> take... well, hopefully, um, Universitas Negeri Jakarta 
one day could facilitate this. <laughs> yeah, I hope, I hope so. <laughs> it would be very interesting. I mean, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to contribute and help out. Good. Okay, okay. that's Subhan. Thank you very much indeed for a very Thank stimulating uh, presentation. Um, I've still got lots of things to say. I'll, I'll contact you. <laughs> okay, you have my email address. You have my yeah, WhatsApp yeah. number to uh, Oh well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. Uh, just uh, thank you everyone. Started, thank you. I hope everyone's doing well and take care. Thank you. Um, before we close, I'd just like to um, say that our next meeting will be uh, four weeks today, Thursday, the 17th of March, and the speaker will be. Uh, Kathleen Hugh from the University of South Australia. So another uh, Australian contribution to our program. I hope to meet you there uh, in a month's time. Thanks again, Pastor Van. Thanks to uh, Thank colleagues at the Bestest Degree Jakarta. And uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Good Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.